Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about homelessness in America with today's guests, Kevin Finn, President and CEO of Strategies to End Homelessness in Cincinnati, and Ruth Schwartz, co-founder and executive director of Shelter Partnership in Los Angeles. Thank you very much for joining us, panel, and a reminder to Zoom attendees that we will take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results and questions submitted to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen will be included in our discussion. We have over half a million people who experience homelessness in this country and the housing crisis has been amplified by the COVID pandemic and the coming economic hit is going to uh, really throw renters and, and homeowners living on the edge to the streets. Uh, let's talk about what you're experiencing in your communities. You're in different parts of the country you have different uh, weather conditions, which affects people during winters in, in particular ways. Um, Kevin, why don't, why don't we start over in Cincinnati? And, um, and if you could just sort of describe uh, the situation in, in your part of the country, that would be great. Sure, and thanks for having me. Um, I think that you know, we haven't even begun to see the worst of what could possibly happen due to the pandemic. I think the, the worst effects in terms of homelessness are still months away. Uh, what we have been seeing locally in Cincinnati though is that you know, for sort of obvious reasons, the pandemic has been very disruptive to our shelters. We actually have uh, still today, five shelters that have either all of their capacity or part of it in hotel motel rooms. My point is that the intake process to our shelter system has been disrupted somewhat. And as a result, we've seen 73% more people sleeping outdoors on the streets in the first six months of this year. 73%? 73%. Now we we have not seen an increase in homelessness yet because actually we've had fewer people in shelter, but more people on the street. So we think that that's indicative of the fact that people in need of shelter are having a harder time getting into shelter because of the disruptions the shelters have seen. And as a result, we have more people unsheltered out on the street. The, the totals in terms of when you add sheltered and unsheltered together, we're not yet seeing an increase. I think that is just a matter of time. Uh, our you know, eviction court was closed for several months and just reopened in June. So there are some reasons why we haven't really started to see the bubble or increase in literal homelessness yet. But what we are seeing is more people outside on the street because um, I believe because they're having trouble accessing emergency shelters. Uh, Ruth, uh, could you just give us a, br a briefing of how you're experiencing this time in Los Angeles? You know, actually, it's a time of opportunity in Los Angeles. Um, LA City and County have stood up about over 5,000 beds, um, mostly in hotel motels, about 37 hotel motels, and um, dozens of recreation park centers. And what they've done is selected people to decompress the shelters because we know that contagion is, you know, when you're close together, then contagion is going to occur. And also to bring people in who are over 65 or people with underlying health conditions at risk of the virus. So um, that's happening and the social services are wrapped around. So a number of people who are on the street are now in motel hotels. Um, so that's all positive. And going forward, the governor um, has put out a plan to purchase, help purchase those hotels and motels. And so there's an active competition right now, either, either for lease or purchase um, and rehab, and then to turn it into either interim or permanent housing with a focus on permanent housing. So, and at the same time, we do have both the city and the county have put $100 million each out for eviction prevention for low-income people. Some of those competitions are just beginning to help people. And of course, we have eviction prevention, eviction control at this time. So um, I'm not saying that that's going to last and that we're going to move forward without an increase in homelessness. But right now, we're, we're doing, being very proactive um, in, on this issue. As you're looking um, three months down the road, right, where we're going to get into the winter months, 
Mm -hmm. uh, are you seeing what Kevin is seeing that, that uh, with the eviction protections on a federal level um, uh, being uh, um, uh, coming to an end or potentially coming to an end um, well, we and, and the economic crisis taking hold, do you see um, a wave coming uh, to you or do you feel like it's manageable at this point? No, I, there's eviction prevention at the local level. So we're depending on that, the city and county level, um, to help protect. How long that will last, I don't know. It's just extended at the county level. So I think it's promising. I, I, I think we're gonna we're gonna have problems in the in the short term, absolutely. Um, as people fall through the cracks. I mean, last year it was estimated that 227 people became homeless on, on an average day, and 277 people escaped homelessness. So, you know, it's more people coming into homelessness in the past. I, I don't expect that's going to change given COVID. Well, I, th I, I think that, that as we move forward, I think uh, perhaps people experiencing homelessness will tick up and the people escaping homelessness is likely to tick down. And, and the, net, uh, the net effect uh, could be uh, quite considerable. Kevin, when when you look at, at the constellation of different services, could you just describe, because I think it's going to be very typical for Ruth as well, it's typical throughout uh, all urban areas that there is a whole range of not only housing services, but also supportive services that, that help people who are uh, coming out of homelessness or trying to prevent homelessness. Could you talk about the, the different services and the different conditions that your constituents um, experience? Well, you know, I think the reality is of our sort of normal day to day is where most of the resources are targeted dollars that come from the Department of Housing and Urban Development and places like that. Um, those resources are really targeted at rehousing people who have already been homeless. And, you know, one of my biggest frustrations in what we do is how much money is, uh, how little money is normally available for anything that would be considered prevention. So in comparison, you know, just to give you an example uh, in Cincinnati, Hamilton County, you know, of the $25 million a year or so that we administer, 24 million of it goes to help people who are already homeless and less than just under 1 million goes to prevention activities. So the, the fact that due to the economic crisis that has accompanied the pandemic, that there are so many people facing loss of their housing, eviction prevention, if we don't manage to stop their uh, eviction, then they might be considered for a service we called shelter diversion, which is targeted at people who are already in doubled up situations and running out of couches to sleep on, so to speak. Um, those are the resources that even in normal times are the leanest and the smallest. And that's really where we're gonna see the most people coming. So given the lack of preventative resources that are out there, uh, you know, a lot of the resources can't really be brought to bear to help people until they're already homeless. And that is true on a regular basis and will likely be even more true in the future. I do think it's worth also noting that, you know, the Hamilton County has also been very proactive about putting CARES Act funding into eviction prevention which is new and different and is a very positive thing, but those dollars have to be spent by December 31st. So, you know, the, the timing of when we will see people coming into the homeless services system and the timing of some of that funding, particularly the CARES Act dollars, doesn't necessarily line up. And Ruth, uh, what are you saying? You know, unlike um, Cincinnati, um, we have a program um, that was voted on by the electorate. It provides $350 million annually for services and rental assistance. So it's a locally, um, it's from a sales tax. Um, and at the city level, through a property tax, um, we're building 10,000 units for mostly for um, homeless, um, permanent supportive housing units. So we're not totally dependent on the federal government. I mean, I think. A long time ago, we realized that wasn't a good decision. There, you know, there isn't enough flexibility. There isn't enough funding. So, we do have some prevention dollars, but, you know, in the end, it's 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 not sufficient. I mean, still, most of the money is being spent on services. We have a big push on outreach services for those people 
on the street um, and trying to engage them. Um, a big push on um, interim housing and then a lot of money going to rapid rehousing. So paying the rent for somebody for a year or two and, and on a declining basis and then hoping that they can sustain themselves thereafter. Um, and then permanent services and permanent supportive housing, help in getting a landlord to accept them and the ser ongoing services. So those are the kinds of service, main services we have. Um, they seem to work well. Um, they're really all aimed at getting people into housing with some money for prevention, but that, that is a missing, a missing piece. It's not, it's not funded at a sufficient level. Um, well, it's, it, yeah. it's interesting what you're saying because you have taxpayers who are analyzing the situation from their perspective and they're voting right. to fund. They're voting to be taxed. Correct. They're voting to be taxed on a local level. They're voting on how that tax is to be used. Right. So it's all voluntary. It's all local. It's all a matter of what happens in, it's not even in California wide. It's, it's Los Angeles specific. Right. Um, now, we just did a, a, an interesting poll that, that really speaks to the question of, of causes of, of homelessness and how we pre prevent that. We had a huge consensus that, that homelessness and housing instability um, is caused by three different factors. Wages are too low for people to afford stable housing, mental health and addiction issues, and systematic equality, so racism, and, and other inequalities that are based in, in race, culture, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. There was, was also a substantial, uh, substantial view that underemployment and unemployment um, is the issue. So in, in many respects, Kevin, your, your, um, your point about how do we create a fire break instead of always fighting the fire after it's been set, right? How do we actually prevent this from, from uh, affecting us. Um, and, and how do you see those money? Let's say you had um, uh, several million dollars to spend on prevention. How would you, you go about in your community uh, taking the role? Would you do what, what has been done in, in Ruth's community in terms of building more affordable housing units? Or would you go into places like employment and jobs training and, and that kind of thing or mental health services? Well, obviously, Cincinnati and L.A. are very different, but some I think the dynamics are probably very different. But I mean, the cause of homelessness is the lack of affordable housing, period, the end. So, you know, less than a third of our homeless people in Cincinnati, Hamilton County have a mental health issue. Less than a third have a substance abuse issue. Um, but they're all still homeless. So, you know, really the cause of homelessness is the lack of affordable housing. Now, that's a very big topic to, to think that you're going to take on. So, and, you know, $1 million or even a couple million dollars isn't necessarily going to fix that problem. We are probably at least 40,000 units of affordable housing short in Hamilton County, Ohio. So, you know, but the reality for us is it, typically costs us about $1,300 to prevent somebody from becoming homeless in our shelter diversion program, which takes somebody who's already doubled up and puts them back into their own housing, you know, the person who's about to enter a shelter. That costs about $1,300. Once a person becomes literally homeless and enters the shelter system or lands on the street, the cost is about $4,000 per person. So you can help three times as many people with the same amount of money if you put it toward a preventative activity rather than waiting for them to be homeless and helping them at that time. So, you know, I, I, I would argue that the answer, the long-term answer to homelessness is more affordable housing. Maybe sort of the medium-term uh, answer is prevention, prevention, prevention. Um, but clearly what we shouldn't be doing is just waiting for people to be homeless and then helping them, which is what I would tell you the federal government requires us to do, because most of the funding that comes from the federal government, you know, people have to be literally homeless already before they're eligible for a lot of those services historically. So, you know, that is, you know, a structural issue that's not necessarily helpful. And Ruth, it seems that, that LA has, has reached these conclusions as well. You know, it's sort of like the same issue with the prison systems where uh, people sometimes uh, get involved in the prison system out of need 
And then when they get into the prison system, the amount of money that is spent to house people in the prison systems, let alone the, depriving them of their freedom and so on, um, is so astronomical, you know, we could, we could all engage in the same kind of experiment that Stockton is, is engaging in, which is to try and um, mm -hmm. basically give money to people who need it to help them get on their feet. Um, how do you see this, this balance playing out in Los Angeles? You know, it's so challenging. I think what's happening in Los Angeles is there's a recognition of the importance of prevention. There's also the reality that people are on the street today. You know, so who do you say first? You know, the person who's, you know, who's suffering on the street or the person who may become homeless. They may not. They may, you know, have a safety net that you don't know about, you know, with another family or the like. So, um, you know, it's just very challenging. So somebody goes into, I mean, I think that's why homeless advocates are big on eviction prevention, you know, because if we can stop it, and it's not like the homeless system can fund everything. I mean, there, there's limited dollars. So I think a lot of what's happening now is there is work to do prevention and to do, you know, try to do families, solve problems and families so that they don't split up, so they're able to stay with one another. But there's also recognition that mainstream systems are driving this, whether it's a child welfare system, when the kid gets taken away, the mom loses her subsidized housing, you know, the welfare system, the mental health system. So trying to place more of those obligations on those systems. So, you know, if someone's going to be evicted from um, a board and care, you know, not to let them become homeless to basically get in there, swoop in, try to do some, you know, problem solving there with the mental health system. So I, I, I think that it's, it's a bigger question and it needs to, it's really a holistic issue. And that's where LA County's going is, is empowering those systems, the obligations, because what we found is the vast, vast majority of no, people that become homeless are known to the system. They're people who use you know, public, public systems, welfare and the like, you know, probably 80, 90%. And if you can interfere and become better at that, um, then you can, you can stop a lot of the, um, the, the, the action on homelessness. And I, I couldn't agree with Ruth more on that. You know, sort of another way of thinking about it is the homeless services system is the safety net for so many other systems that are out there. When, you know, when the education system fails people, people become homeless. When mental health systems fail, people become homeless. When substance abuse treatment resources fail, people become homeless. You know, and on and then, you know, medical systems. I mean, there, there are so many systems that are out there that when someone slips through the cracks of those systems, where do they end up? They end up homeless. So. Um, there's only so much as a person who's, you know, helping run a homeless services system you can do because there's only so much you can do because you'd, you'd have to fix the mental health system and fix the healthcare system and fix the educational system and fix the criminal justice system and fix all of those in order to have not ha not have at least some people becoming homeless. There can be a frustration of uh, th that arises amongst taxpayers with the analysis and the data and the complexity of this whole situation that results in people say, well, let's just starve the beast. Let's just take away money and then everybody will sort of figure it out. And there, yeah, there will be people who won't be able to navigate, but that's kind of the cost of, of having this, putting the system under stress and then having individuals just respond. Is that, is that real? And I'm asking this in a very serious way. Is that realistic? Is that a realistic way in which we can uh, address the issue by putting everybody under a lot more stress and basically saying sink or swim? I think a first step would be allow us to be smarter with the money. You know, all these government resources, you know, and we don't have the level of local government funding that Ruth was describing in L.A., you know, so we're much more reliant on the federal funding. And as I've already mentioned, it comes with strings attached to it that just don't make any sense. Having to wait until people are already homeless to help them is ridiculous when, as I also have already said, you could help three times as many people with the same amount of money if you were just allowed 
to use those dollars over here rather than over here. So I would argue that the, you know, it's not a matter of starving the beast or taking the money away, but how about just take the handcuffs off and let us do what's smart in our community with the funding that's already available. Probably the biggest eye roll I get frequently from people is when I say, I'm not even sure we need more money to significantly reduce homelessness. We just need the flexibility to do what is needed in Cincinnati, Hamilton County with the money that's already available. Ruth, how do you feel about the, the idea of just sort of starving the bees, putting everybody a lot, uh, under a lot more pressure and having them sort it out? Yeah, I wish that would work, but it's not. I mean, there's going to be un, unrealized consequences for doing that. You know, if you allow that, you know, it's like a chaos situation. There's a lot of public costs that are going to go on. You know, just trying to address, you know, people you know, trying to cope on the street and, and a lot of, um, you know, negative impact. So I, I, don't, I don't think that's the way a, a advanced society, you know, operates, should operate. Um, and I think, you know, if you want chaos, that's what you'll get. Yeah, I, I agree with Ruth completely that, you know, if you, like right now we have the homeless systems catching people that fail from these other systems I think if you did what you're describing, the burden would just shift somewhere else. The problem wouldn't go away. You would just see the burden of taking care of people land in a different place. I think that logically we're, uh, we, we reach a dead end because if one of the issues is education that allows you to get a job or get a, get a higher paying job, if one of the issues is, is mental health that you're dealing with, Mm -hmm. um, if one of the issues is, um, is uh, poverty or that your children have been taken away and now you're th being thrown out, then placing all these people under more stress, mm -hmm. there's no place for them to go. You don't suddenly get educated so you can get a, a, you know, a, a better job. You don't suddenly dispense with your mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So I think stress only works when people are equipped to respond in a way that's productive. I think there's a, there's a huge amount of, of issue here where stress that will not elicit a different response. It just, it just can't. Right, right. I agree. Um, I mean, folks that, that are homeless are under such stress as they are, or people at risk of homelessness. And, you know, you don't want to take, take away any positive decision making from them um, by putting more stress on them. It causes people to you know, go into, you know, going back to their substance abuse, going back to bad behavior. Um, it's, it's not a healthy condition. I mean, these folks, a lot of them are already, you know, experiencing PTSD and, um, you know, life is really not pleasant for them. Um, it, it's, it's, not, it's not beneficial to them or to society to do that. You, you really, and it's, it's not the right thing to do. You know, it's not what we were brought up to, you know, we care about one another. We were, we were taught to care and to provide. Um, we just took a, a, a poll about where the, uh, where the investment should go. And we, we, we talked about unemployment, you know, job training and, and, and so on. And the, the vast majority of people um, uh, felt that, um, that the investment ought to be in affordable housing. Um, if indeed that is the the place where dollars need to be invested mm -hmm. um, how do we sustainably deal with this so that if we don't eradicate homelessness completely we reduce homelessness in areas where it, it is a significant significant problem is the issue just a matter of how do we create affordable housing situations uh, for people on a sustained basis so that at different levels of income and capability, uh, there are solutions and different types of solutions for people. How do we get there, Kevin? What do you think? That, that's a really, really big question. I mean, my um, sort of first response to that would be, you know, Cincinnati has seen a significant amount of redevelopment and, you know, most of the, you know, tax credits and things like that that have been given out locally have gone into high-end housing development and things like that. 
you know, my tax abatements, things like that, you know, my thought is always, you know, everything should be a win-win situation. What I have told people in local government here is that as those tax abatements expire and, you know, local government is seeing increased revenue as a result of those abatements expiring, why can't that money go back, go specifically into affordable housing development? You know, they're dollars that are somewhat unspoken for because the city hadn't been collecting them. In that way, you know, redevelopment could actually come around and actually fund affordable housing development. That's a win-win for everybody. Some people would say that you have to stop all the redevelopment and things like that. And I just don't think that's necessarily realistic. But I think there are ways that local governments can sort of position the moving parts that the redevelopment funds affordable housing development and everybody wins um, rather than those increased tax revenues going to something unrelated to housing. It seems to it seems that some of these these ideas are, come out of a philosophical place in which mm -hmm. uh, municipalities see that they can increase their tax base at the higher end ta higher taxpayer end. So they basically throw resources at people who already have a, are of means in order to attract those people into their tax base. Right. So, so money is being used in a way that is completely counter to what you're describing, uh, Kevin, and there's no supporting logic un uh, under that logic for any investment in, in support of uh, support, uh, sustainable housing solutions. Um, Ruth, how do, how do you see this, and, and do we have to start seeing things a little bit differently, where cities are actually there to create environments in which there are a whole range of people who actually support, you know, American civil life, and, and not all of them are at the wealthier end, and, and yeah. you know, we, we need to look at these cities differently. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I started off in affordable housing. Um, and, and I've watched for the last, you know, 30, 40 years, how it hasn't been taken seriously by our local governments, our state governments. And, and you know, in, Cal in Los Angeles, we're 540,000 units short of affordable housing. You know, we've let housing decay, you know, gotten rid of housing at the low end um, and built housing at the high end. And, you know, now we have luxury housing that sits empty. So I think we do need a commitment to it. We do need a permanent source of funding for it. And that's a lot of people in California, um, policymakers and affordable housing advocates have been coming together on that. Um, we need to look at different kinds of housing. We look at manufactured housing, you know, housing from ship containers, tiny homes. I mean, I, I don't think anything's off the table, should be off the table right now. Shared housing. Um, so, you know, it's just, where we match people. We've got to look at every tool in the toolbox um, to try to get people housed. It's not okay for, for the community or for the people who are homeless to be you know, on the street or living in their cars. So you know, RV parks, we have to go back to things that we've looked, courts that we've looked at before and we've kind of said, oh no, we're better than that. We're not better than that. You know, We need to protect the housing we have that's affordable and we have to build more um, in, in all different venues. And it's what's the positive thing about homelessness, and there isn't really any positive in it, is that it's caused a lot of people to come to the table to try to look for solutions that weren't involved in this issue before. It was a narrow group of people, you know, who might think, oh, I wanna get, I, I'm just worried about my tax credit for this deal so I can build the housing, you know, and get, you know, whatever, help people, but also make a, some kind of a, profit on it so I can move on to the next development. No, it's, it's, it's so many more people that are, um, you know, bending the curve and, and coming in with the solutions. Um, we just took a poll in which we have a 60-40 split. The question was, uh, do we think um, homelessness can be fully eradicated in the United States? And 40% uh, said yes, 60% said no. Our job, our job, is to make it 100% yes mm -hmm. and figure out a whole range of different solutions to address the problem. And our job is also this. Those of us who are comfortable 
have to decide that to have the America we want, we have to do things differently. We have to invest differently. We have to think a little bit differently. We have to be willing to experiment in the way that you, Kevin, are experimenting and that you uh, are, Ruth. Uh, thank you so much for sharing the work that you are doing in each of your respective communities. It's been a very useful discussion. And let's continue that energy. That's the nonprofit report. Attendees, thank you so much for uh, coming in and responding and taking part in this. And keep it going in your communities. Mm -hmm.